Hello and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast, a podcast about Haskell. Haskell is a functional programming language that we use here at IT Pro TV, and we're just super excited about this episode. I'm your host, Cameron, and with me today we have Taylor Fossack, our lead engineer here at IT Pro TV. How are you doing, Taylor? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you, Cam? Can't complain. It's going well, I would say. Full I of just, fries. I just ate it so many fries. <laughs> oh, it was so good. Um, but today, uh, I just wanted to kind of talk about um, an architecture that is you know, function like it's a good functional architecture is uh, ports and adapters. And what are ports and adapters? So I'll kind of talk more about ports because that's really what I want to do. Um, so so ports are um, kind of responsible for you know interacting with the outside world, and and that could be a web app. It could be um, the database layer, um, a way to, to communicate with the outside world. It's so not your. It's your, the thing that's making a call to the database or to some external service that you're using, or even like writing to the console. Exactly. Yeah, and adapters are kind of everything in inside, kind of handling all the business logic. Okay. Um, and being able to kind of say, hey, this is what this is. So adapters take their input from the ports and then do some other stuff, and then what? Talk to another port. Talk to another adapter. Uh, it just depends on what your, the flow of your your, your diagram. Okay, so it is. could be either one, right? If you have you know an internal structure that needs to talk to another internal structure, you'd be using adapters. But if you need to call it to the database, you'd be using a port. Okay. Um, you know, kind of it kind of keeps things you know together. You know, not so much, uh, not not so jumbled. It kind of keeps it clear, like the boundaries between like pure logic and 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 input output logic, right? Right. And so you mean the pure logic is. Uh, what a lot of people sometimes call business logic, the interesting stuff that your business is doing or your application is doing. Right. And the ports handle the maybe not so interesting stuff of actually performing an HTTP call or something like that. Exactly. Okay. So now that we have kind of the vocabulary of this architecture, could you explain in more detail what the architecture is? Kind of the, the ports and adapters uh, architecture allows us uh, some, some nice, some, there's some niceties around it. So, um, it kind of allows us to separate that input output um, stream uh, from you know the internal business logic, and it, it keeps our the ability to test internal business logic easier because you're not always interacting with you know some some input output that could you know, mess with the result. Um, yeah, it, it's a lot easier to test a pure function because if you have to write a test that let's say interacts with the database, then that means to run your test suite, you have to have your database up and running and your schema has to be up to date and you may have to have fake data populated in there. Mm -hmm. But if you're testing pure code, you just have to have a bunch of values in memory, which are a lot easier to make. Right. Also, you can test things in parallel if they don't have to talk to a database because maybe you have two tests for the same piece of business logic in your code and they would both be writing to the same database table. You're going to have a bad time unless you really do a good job of separating those things out. Mm -hmm. Whereas in pure code, you can just run two things at the same time, no problem. Right, and and you know, at, at some point, at some level, you want to test the ports. You want to make sure that, oh yeah, given a set of input, like you're getting a reliable source of, of output, uh, because we, you know, that's that's what you expect from an API. Yeah. You send the same thing to an API, you would expect. You know, it's to return you the same values. Um, At so, some point, you want that integration test to prove that your API actually works. Right, but, but the just, unit tests on the inside, those are still really valuable. Right, and the integration tests, they're a little more uh, boilerplate to kind of set up generally. Yeah. You know, and they're a little more, uh, in, I wouldn't say invasive, but they're definitely a little more meaty, mm -hmm. per se. Um, so it's nice to be able to have that separation and, and have, you know, guarantee that, you know, the pure functions, they're going to do what they need to do and, and those individual units are going to perform as intended uh, but we also can can create those tests for the ports as well yeah uh, to allow that kind of testing um so cam we're talking about this architecture today because of this blog post that mark seaman wrote called uh functional architecture is ports and adapters so mm -hmm. pretty straightforward um but he makes a point in there that you can do this architecture in other languages he uses f sharp in, as an example mm -hmm. But in those languages, it can be really hard to have the discipline to force yourself into this architecture constantly. And if you ever mess up, then suddenly you have something that is both a port and an adapter, and it becomes hard to you know tease those apart. Mm -hmm. um, what is it about Haskell that helps us write programs that are in this architecture and get these benefits from them? Uh, yeah, the the ability of of purity and and, and types, right? The mm -hmm. Type system enforces you know, a lot of, you know, need to have type A 
across the boundary is type A still. You know, like mm -hmm. it, it sh shouldn't be able to change across the boundary. Yeah, um, and we've mentioned purity a couple times, and I just want to be clear about what we're talking about. It, specifically with regards to Haskell, it's a function that doesn't operate in I.O. For our purposes, mm -hmm. at least at IT Pro, that's typically what we mean by pure or not in our like application level handler. Right. Something that you give it a bunch of inputs and it gives you an output end of story. Whereas impure code is something that has to be executed in some context, either with a database connection or with I.O. or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're talking about pure functions, that's what we mean. Right, right, right. You know, we, we read through this article um, a little bit and, you know, it's, you know, I heard about ports and adapters in school and stuff like that. But, you know, kind of talking about it is a lot different than like implementing it because mm -hmm. cause in reality, cause Haskell kind of forces our hand at this, like, uh, and we don't have to really think about um, the the what the architecture really is in, right. in, in the grand scheme of it, things. It forces you to do this architecture without having to be consciously aware, thinking, I'm implementing ports and adapters here. Right. Instead, you say, oh, this function suddenly needs I.O., so I have to put it in the type, and it propagates out everywhere. And then that encourages you to try to constrain the places where that's used to say, no, let's only do I.O. over here at the boundary and right. keep everything else pure. Yeah, and in our code base here, like we're very we're very adamant about that. Um, you know, if we kind of see that, oh, we're passing, you know, the the monadic context through all of these functions, when you know we don't necessarily always need the database connection in every single one of those functions, we should kind of take a step back and say, why don't we just find the data we need and then pass it to a pure function that allows us to you know have a little more certainty and not have to worry too much about you know passing this this. Working in, in the uh, yeah. I/O monad versus instead of passing this giant implicit context around mm -hmm. of basically the whole real world, you identify the little pieces of that that you do need and turn them into regular function arguments. Right. And in the course of doing that refactoring, sometimes your function signature can look more complicated because it's like getting more arguments mm -hmm. um, instead of just being in I/O or app or whatever. But conceptually, it becomes a lot easier to reason about because just looking at that type declaration, you know. Those are the only things it has access to, so that's mm -hmm. all it's going to do. Right. It's especially nice for a long-running, a long-lived application where many different developers are working on it, and people are maintaining it, fixing bugs, and you get that confidence on that pure code that when you refactor something, you haven't accidentally broken some other part of the system that relied on some internal state that that thing fiddled with. Right. 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 Yeah, and I and I highly value that of Haskell. Um, it really makes, you know. And there's a few of our podcasts we've talked about refactoring in general and, and how yeah. you know easy you know Haskell makes that uh, but the 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 type signature is just it makes it easy to understand okay we're going to pass all of these things in and we're going to adapt them to the type we want them to be right mm -hmm. aka adapter right <laughs> crazy huh guys that's where the name came from <laughs> whoa <laughs> uh, but you know that that's kind of the nice um, aspect of, of Haskell is being able to read that and, and know, okay, I take these arguments and I transform them and I adapt them to be the type I'm returning. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, a lot of other languages, that's not, it's not always the case. And, it, and it's not easy to kind of understand, oh, wait, I'm, why am I trying to, you know, keep these boundaries separate? Uh, because, you know, those other languages, it's just not as clear. Right. It can be hard to tell looking at a function if it's pure or not. Mm -hmm. And in Haskell, it's very clear if that's the case. Um, and it's interesting because this blog post by Mark reminded me of an earlier screencast by Gary Bernhardt, who um, did that famous JavaScript Watt talk where he shows off all these kind of weird edge cases of JavaScript behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, but he has a um, screencast where he talks about this concept of functional core imperative shell, which is very mm -hmm. similar where all of your business logic on the quote unquote inside of your application is pure. And mm -hmm. then you have a very small layer on the outside that's responsible for collecting stuff from the outside world, passing it off to your application, and then taking that result and sending it back to the outside world. Right. So it's funny how this concept of um, either functional core imperative shell or ports and adapters keeps showing up, um, you know, in a guy who works with Ruby full time or Mark, I think he does a lot of F sharp, C sharp, kind of the .NET world, mm -hmm. or even like you mentioned in computer science curriculum, which is often Java or Python or something like that. Right, very object oriented. All these language ecosystems have recognized that this is a powerful, useful architecture to set up your applications. But in Haskell, it's 
just the way that you do things. There's, it's almost harder to not follow this architecture. Right. So I see a lot of benefit in using a language that pushes you in the right direction like that. Yeah. Because obviously, if, if all these people are using it, it's not wrong. Like, you know, it's a, it's, <laughs> it's probably not a bad idea. Right. Like, there's probably other options out there. But the fact that it allows you to protect your, your internal business logic from the outside world, like, mm -hmm. that's important. Yeah. You know, like, you know, we don't want to be able to just you know, come in and, and immediately, you know, from the outside world somehow modify some of the internal like business logic. And, you know, Haskell doesn't really allow that, allow that to happen. Yeah. And it can be even more benign than like leaking details about your business logic. Um, one example I've seen before is in Ruby, there's a templating language, which is basically a wrapper around Ruby. And there have been times where you can have a template that inside the template, it makes a call to the database. And if you put that inside a loop in your template, because you're like listing all of your users and you want to get some associated object with them, you could be making a thousand queries in your template of all places. And templates feel like they should be pure functions, you know, like right. don't talk to the database. You should already have the information you need. Right. So yeah. this architecture helps you avoid problems like that in addition to a bunch of others. Right. And and it's not to say that like, like you said, it's just harder to make Haskell not be ports of adapters. Mm -hmm. You know, there, I, I can go through code we've written, you know, when we first starting Haskell and just, we would, you know, pass this giant context all around and, and, you know, we're going to find data here and here and here and mm -hmm. always be talking to the outside world. And, you know, kind of, you know, over time you kind of realize like, this just doesn't feel right. Yeah. Um, and so Haskell can, and Haskell allows you to refactor that out too. You mm -hmm. know, like, Oh, we can make, make this one, but like one piece. Yeah. And that feeling of like, this isn't quite right. That's Haskell nudging you in the quote unquote right direction for this architecture. Mm -hmm. And where a lot of other languages kind of push you away from this architecture, Haskell pulls you in, says, yes, keep doing that. That's the right thing. You can do it. <laughs> right. And, um, yeah, I think there's, you know, a nice, um, kind of like ports and adapters allows you to kind of see that outside, you know, you've got various aspects that, that are calling your API, your code base, whatever, whatever that may be. Yeah. We talk about APIs a lot because we do web programming. So that's kind of our bread and butter, but this right. applies to other applications as well. Right. And, and it allows you to see, okay, what has the possibility to, to talk to, you know, what does it have the possibility to talk to? And then inside it allows you to kind of, you know, keep all of those, those functions that, you know, allow you to be agile and quick and, you know, reuse and, and have these, you know, validation functions or having like auth checks or stuff like that, depending on what your auth check is, is mm -hmm. if, you know, that's calling out and finding a user and understanding what permissions they have, like that could probably involve more, you know, uh, more of a port than, than you're wanting to use in that case. But, um, it just kind of allows you to keep all that logic just so, um, just so separate, you know, yeah. and not feel like, like, I don't know. I feel like there's been times in, in, you know, like there's frameworks that do that kind of force your hand in this in other languages, right? Like, you know, you can have, you know, because there's MVC, right? MVC mm -hmm. kind of, um, in my my mind, can can translate into ports and adapters in some regards. Yeah, because um, your controller ends up usually being a port where it's collecting right. information from the outside world, and then your view is kind of a port in that it's presenting that information back mm -hmm. out, and then your model is typically an adapter in that scenario. Right. Right. And, you know, it, we, you know, using sales when we were in JavaScript land, it kind of, um, kind of kept that stuff separate. Mm -hmm. Um, it did get hairy at times. Like we can find ourselves like in a service, like pretty much doing an entire controller action mm -hmm. when that should really, it, like the idea of a service is really, it should be more of an adapter and saying, Hey, I take these inputs and I give you this output. Right. Rather than like, Oh, we're going to call out to this service and that service. And we're going to build this giant thing for you. And the controller is going to say, I listen here and I, I accept requests here. Yeah. And then I just send it to a service and that does everything. Like that's just super hard to go back into and understand. Like it doesn't, it, like, yeah, MVC could be like ports and adapters, but it's not like, it's not, you mm -hmm. know, it's easy to not do that. And nothing is pushing you in the right direction there. Right. You said that shoving all this stuff into the service didn't feel right, but that was just kind of a gut feeling. There was nothing nothing in the language or the framework telling you maybe don't do that. Right. Whereas in Haskell, you do get the, you know, Oh, I have to propagate IO through all these functions or I'm passing in a hundred arguments. This, this is very clearly telling me something is wrong. Mm -hmm. no, so for sure. 
I think I've said just about everything I, I know about this functional architecture being ports and adapters. Do you have anything else to add? Mm, I don't think so. I've been a little, you know, all over the place today, <laughs> you know, just kind of you know, coming out of the food coma a little bit. And, yeah. You know, kind Sweating of up a storm. Yeah. It's a little warm in here, uh, but you know, that, that is what it is. <laughs> it's I'm, Florida. I mean, it's Florida, but I also have, you know, my, we, my, my fair <laughs> issues of sweating. So at least we're not all those recording sweaters outside. out there. I'm always here for you guys. <laughs> always representing. Uh, but anywho, we, you know, this was a great article. It was uh, cool to kind of go bla blast from the past. Um, I, you know, kind of was a little all over the place, but I think because this, you know, Haskell has, you know, has this identity that pushes you towards ports and adapters, you know, it, it makes it really easy to um, just keep that, that logic separate from input and outputs and, you know, all the internal business logic, those things. You know, it's very it's important to keep those separate like it doesn't mm -hmm. it allows you know employees who are coming in or we, when we revisit a code later like understanding that oh like this is just business logic this is the inputs the outputs if you need to change something later like half school is functional and its compiler is amazing sure and, is and you know the type system is incredible so like that really you know just kind of all meshes nice nicely together yeah well said so uh, thanks for chatting with me about ports and adapters, Cameron. Of course. Thanks for having me. It's always great to have you on the show. And thank you for listening to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. If you liked what you heard today and want to know more about us, please check out our website at haskellweekly.news. This has been episode 10, and we'll see you next time. Adios. Adios.